Hey everyone, Zach here from the Launchpad, and this weekend NASA surprised us all with not just one massive announcement, but two. On Friday, April 16, 2021, NASA announced that the Human Landing System contract of the Artemis program had officially been awarded. Early in the afternoon, rumors started to fly that a press release was coming soon and that SpaceX might have been selected. And just hours later, NASA officials held a teleconference with the media where they shared that the Option A contract had been awarded to SpaceX. Now I point out the name Option A, and we're going to get into that a little bit later. NASA officially selected SpaceX and their lunar starship, which many were excited about, but I also think many were surprised. Almost a year to the day, NASA had announced three companies that were being given some funding to design and plan their bid for the HLS, and SpaceX actually received the least funding compared to the other two, and actually by quite a bit. So there were three bids submitted, and let's take a quick look at each one of them. The first bid was from Blue Origin, who teamed up with Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and Draper, and they were called the Blue Origin National Team, or just the National Team. Their proposal was a three-stage integrated lander vehicle, also known as an ILV. Blue Origin would build the descent and landing stage, which we saw called Blue Moon, while Lockheed Martin would build the ascent stage, drive from Orion, and Northrop Grumman would build a transfer stage. Blue Origin said the ILV could dock either with the Orion capsule directly or with the Gateway Station, and the elements could be launched separately on Blue Origin's New Glenn rocket, which is in development, or United Launch Alliance Vulcan Centaur rocket, which is being tested, and be integrated in lunar orbit. Or it could be combined all together and launched on an SLS. An uncrewed demonstration test was planned for 2023, prior to the crewed landing in 2024. The second bid was from Dynetics, who worked with Sierra Nevada and over 25 other organizations as they proposed the Dynetics Human Landing System, the DHLS. Their system consisted of a Descent Ascent Element, a DAE, and two Modular Propellant Vehicles, MPVs. Since the MPVs were identical, it was considered a two-stage system. DHLS could be launched fully integrated on an SLS rocket or in three ULA Vulcan Centaurs, one for the DAE and one for each of the MPVs. It could, again, dock with either the Gateway Station or directly with Orion. The reusable DAEs could accommodate two to four astronauts depending on their spacesuits and supply weight. After returning to lunar orbit, the crew would transfer back to the Orion capsule or Gateway Station, return to Earth, and the DAE would remain in orbit while waiting for refueling and two new MPVs and the next crew. And the third and ultimately the one selected by NASA was SpaceX, who was the only one to offer a fully integrated lander vehicle. The Lunar Starship, which will be launched by SpaceX's Super Heavy rocket. Previously, NASA said that several starships would be used if selected. One is a fuel depot in Earth orbit, another is a tanker to take fuel to the depot, and then the crewed Lunar Starship that would launch from Earth and travel to the Moon. SpaceX confirmed that the award would be used to build the Lunar Optimized Starship to transfer crews from lunar orbit to the surface, but not originally from Earth to lunar orbit. This is because they don't want to have to human rate the Super Heavy booster immediately. During the teleconference, we learned some more details on how this system and partnership will work. Lunar Starship will launch, followed by one to two tankers for Starship refueling in Earth orbit. Lunar Starship will then perform a translunar injection and journey to the moon where it can wait for up to 100 days for its crew. Once in orbit, an Artemis crew will launch in an Orion capsule atop an SLS rocket and make their way to a rendezvous. Once the two are in lunar orbit, they will meet. The first Artemis missions will dock Orion directly to Starship, but in the future we'll see them both dock to the new Lunar Gateway Station, where they will transfer from the Orion to the Starship. Once aboard, Starship will depart and head to the lunar surface, where they will carry out their mission, and then the Lunar Starship will launch from the surface in one piece and return to lunar orbit again, where again it will either dock with the Orion capsule or the station before the crew makes their journey home on Orion. Starships can be refueled again and basically become a moon taxi from the orbit to the lunar surface and back. It'll have to be refueled, so it's expected that tanker starships will make their journey to lunar orbit for refueling. Now, earlier I mentioned that NASA had selected SpaceX for the Option A contract. This contract is for two demonstration missions. The first mission will be a fully uncrewed demonstration of all the steps of the mission, followed by the second, which will be a crewed demonstration mission with Artemis III which will be humanity's return to the moon for the first time in over 50 years and will bring the first woman and first person of color to the lunar surface. NASA made it clear during the media question portion of the teleconference that they're making final preparations to open another contract for an option B contract, which could be used to see other agencies with lunar lander options. 
NASA wants in the future there to be multiple options, but Starship will be the first. And let's be honest, it's going to be hard for any other lander to beat it with the size of Starship and just what it can do because of that size and capacity. Now let's dive into why NASA actually picked SpaceX rather than Dynetics or Blue Origin. There were some technical reasons other than just the costs. The national team lander, NASA didn't feel like was advanced enough of a design, and they were worried that the propulsion system wouldn't necessarily work. Also, the national team planned to remove the uncrewed test and planned to go straight to a cruise test, which NASA did not like. With the Dynetics bid, NASA worried about some of the refueling requirements, but the biggest issue was the weight. Currently, it was too heavy to even function, and NASA didn't want ideas, they wanted actual bids of systems. Now, SpaceX did have some drawbacks, but many more pros that NASA has shared with us. The first is the massive payload that could be carried by the Lunar Starship. Full rovers, payloads, and other equipment could be sent just in one mission, and that could change what we could do on the surface. Another thing that stood out is that Lunar Starship was guaranteeing four astronauts to the service, where the other were two. Now, we know the Starship model can take up to 100 or more people, or maybe even 500 people for Earth-to-Earth -Earth transport. So the guarantee of four is something that we may see expanded in the future, should NASA choose to launch multiple Orion capsules to the Gateway Station. Starship also has a lot more fuel options, based on how it much can be stored on board. If they need to abort the landing, they could go back to orbit, make another attempt, go back to Gateway. Also, Starship carries a lot of liquid oxygen, which means it could open more opportunities on the surface, rather than needing multiple landers for supplies. Lunar Starship can also handle a crew for seven days. Depending on the internal designs, this could also be extended. Now, in 2019, former NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine shared that the goal for the crew Artemis missions was to land, do some quick experiments, and then leave. We're now talking about full seven-day missions, which is a massive step forward to living and operating on the lunar surface permanently. As SpaceX said, their bid is to make a lunar-optimized Starship, which based on the renders in the bid and the images that have been released from SpaceX, the lunar Starship will look very different from the plans for the Earth-to-Earth -Earth and Mars transports. Lunar Starship can never return to Earth. It won't have flaps, a heat shield, and other equipment required for re-entry. And I actually think that this is a great thing about Lunar Starship. Should NASA or SpaceX ever choose to replace a Lunar Starship, they can land it on the moon or turn it into a new space station. When we're talking the scale of this lander, we're talking about one Starship being similar to the entire living space of the International Space Station. Land a few of those on the moon, bring some corridor connectors, and you'd have a pretty amazing moon base rather quickly and rather probably not that expensively, or dock them together in orbit and you've got a massive space station. But that's a topic for another video. Now that was the first announcement from NASA, but they weren't done yet. Just a day later, they announced that they were changing the full plan for the new EVA spacesuits. We saw these suits for the first time in a demo last year, but they have decided to go a different route and open it up to an outside company to submit bids, not only for design and manufacturing, but also for the operation. I took a dive into the contract description that has been released so you don't have to, and they've been moving very fast with this contract timeline, but they also have some very interesting usage scenarios where they want these suits to be designed for. NASA released a request for information, an RFI, for the Exploration Extravehicular Activity Service, with the purpose to collect information from industries interested to assist NASA in developing the procurement strategy for the commercial services approach to providing the EVA capability for the ISS, the Artemis program, and more. Historically, NASA has relied on government-owned hardware to provide the EVA capability to the missions. NASA is now expecting to achieve EVA capability through the purchase of a commercial EVA service concept without hardware deliverables from the government. The agency is anticipating the procurement approach similar to those used for the commercial crew transport capability, the commercial resupply service contracts, and the gateway logistics service contracts to leverage the growing space commerce market in reducing the overall cost to the government. NASA's current EVA capability was achieved over 40 years ago with the EMU, but NASA is now looking for its successor that will be used on the ISS, but also on many other interesting destinations in the future. One of the two supporting documents of the RFI is a 175-page Exploration EVA System Concept of Operation, which covers everything from launching the suits to space, preparations, during the mission, post-missions, and more. One part that really stuck out to me is where NASA wants this suit to be designed to use. While there are a wider array of possible and feasible variations across the spectrum of human spacelife architecture, there exists a limited overarching destination classes. EVA on spacecraft, microgravity of an engineered surface, EVA on a small natural body, 
milligravity on an asteroid or moon to Mars, EVA on the moon, partial gravity, planetary surface in a vacuum, and EVA on Mars, partial gravity, planetary surface in a partial atmosphere. In this documentation, NASA goes through the four steps for each EVA option. These are the road to EVA, prep and pre-breathe on the EVA day, the EVA itself, and then post-EVA. NASA has these concepts for the following locations, and they're pretty interesting. The International Space Station, the Gateway Station, a captured asteroid, near-Earth asteroids, NEAs, the moons of Mars, the moon of Earth, and Mars. Now, you may think that it'll take years to figure this out, but that would be wrong, because NASA is working at full speed to stay on timeline for the Artemis missions coming up in just the next couple of years. And if everything goes to plan, the new EVA contract will be awarded by the end of this year, 2021. Interested companies will need to file their RFI response documents by the 29th of April, just about 12 days later. NASA will hold an industry day on the 14th of May. Draft requests for proposals will be due on June 18th, with final responses on July 8th. Requests for proposals will be released on August 12th, with final proposals due on the 16th of September, and just three months later, the contracts will be awarded. In the RFI, NASA has estimated the number of flight-rated suits they will need right off the bat to support their missions, and it's as follows, but obviously, more will be needed for replacements and new missions in the future. NASA wants six suits for the International Space Station, four for on-station, and two for on-Earth as spares. They also want 16 suits for the Moon. 14 for the Artemis surface missions, and 2 for the Gateway Station. Many expect that SpaceX will of course submit a bid for these suits, and I personally really hope they submit an EVA version of the current flight suits used in Crew Dragon, but it'll be interesting to see who else comes forward to submit proposals. Now, I know that was a lot of information, and believe me, that was like 5% of the info released from NASA in the last couple days. So if you have questions, let me know in the comments, I'll try to find the answers for you. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss a new video or live broadcast, and follow us on Twitter to stay up to date on everything space as it happens. This was a new style of video for me, so let me know in the comments what you think, other topics you'd like to see me cover, and any other feedback. Thank you for watching guys, this is Zach with the Launchpad, signing off.